My guest today is Kane Hodder. He is a multi-award winning actor, producer, and stunt person with hundreds of credits. He's also cinema's most prolific killer with more on-screen kills than any other actor. As a legendary stuntman, he's worked with luminaries from Wes Craven, Sean Cunningham, and Rob Zombie to David Fincher, Joel Schumacher, and Tony Scott. Scores of acting credits include supernatural monsters along with layered portrayals of real-life killers like Ed Gein and Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. He's played in comedies and dramatic roles, including opposite Charlize Theron in her Oscar-winning performance in Monster. After surviving a near-death accident, he worked his way up through Hollywood, leading to his iconic status in the Friday the 13th series. His brilliant portrayal of Jason Voorhees cemented the character into the pop culture zeitgeist and placed him in the pantheon of movie monsters. It's a feat he will repeat again with his character Victor Crowley in the Hatchet series. He released his autobiography, Unmasked, in 2011, followed by a documentary, To Hell and Back, The Kane Hodder Story, in 2017, and the follow-up book, Kill, in 2021. Kane's candid account of his life, especially in regards to a fire stunt that went horribly wrong and the mental and physical struggle he endured during his recovery is inspirational. I can attest his story helped me through hard times and he's the inspiration behind this show. Famous for playing scary and intimidating, Kane Hodder is truly a man who chews iron and spits nails with the receipts to prove it. He also carries a deep reverence for his characters and his fans, making him a beloved icon. Kane, it's a pleasure to see you. Dax, it's a pleasure to see you as well. I love the <clears throat> background of your desk there. Uh, some pretty cool stuff. Oh, even the killer and I. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's good to be here, man. That uh, you and I talked uh, in the past in uh, Atlanta, and uh, mm -hmm. it's good to be on with you. So there is a lot I want to ask you, so I'm going to try and move quickly. Okay. Your father is James K. Hodder Jr., born in Kearney, New Jersey, and his nickname for you was Doc. He was a civil engineer with the Army Corps of Engineers and a member of the Society of American Military Engineers. He passed away in 1980 at the start of your career. Unfortunately, he was never able to see your success. Your mother is Doris Louise Hodder. She was born in Sioux City, Iowa. She survived your father by 25 years. She enjoyed a busy life riding motorcycles, attending concerts, playing cards, bingo, and dancing. She would boast if there was no one to dance with, she'd dance with the refrigerator. Nothing got her down, and she was the life of any party. She was a proud mother, and her support of your ambitions was and goals was unwavering. You were born on April 8th. 1955 in Auburn, California. It was a Friday. God. Wow. You spent your early years in Sparks, Nevada, and always loved scary things. You turned your garage into a haunted house for Halloween and would often go dressed as Frankenstein. You scared yourself watching the birds too young at a friend's house, and you collected all the Aurora Monster model kits. This is my vintage 1963 Aurora model of the a creature of the Black Lagoon. Oh, yeah. When Joe Dante was on the show, he identified as a monster kid, which were the 60s kids who had the Aurora models, mo watched monster movies, and read horror comics. Were you a monster kid, and did your parents have any restrictions on what you were able to watch as a child? Uh, I was a monster kid, for sure. All those Aurora models, I wish I still had them. Uh, because I painstakingly built them and painted them. Uh, just seeing that creature again, wow, that's amazing. I, the Wolfman, the Frankenstein, the Dracula uh, creature. Was there another one? Phantom Mummy. of the Opera, I think. Mummy and Phantom, yeah. Probably. But yeah, I, I definitely uh, was a monster kid, but my... Parents weren't crazy about me watching uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad didn't really care, but my mom was a little hesitant. But, you know, it wasn't as available as it is now. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, you had to fucking... Uh, do I have to watch my language? No, you don't have okay. to watch your language. You had to fucking go up to the TV and turn the knob to change the channels. There was no remotes, and, you know... I sound like the old fucking old man <laughs> complaining about ah the old days, but it, it was very different then. And uh, so 
the seeing those kind of movies was not as easy by any means as it is now. So uh, they didn't have to do that much to have me avoid it. They weren't really against it, but they didn't think it was the best thing at, you know, age eight to be watching horror films. But <laughs> I, I never had that restriction on my sons um, because I thought it's almost like a desensitization thing where the more you see something, the less scary it is in a way, yeah. real life things. So, you know, I, I don't think it's so bad for young younger people to watch scary stuff if they can handle it not yeah. you know shouldn't be forced on anyone but if it's something that the the kid is interested in i don't i'm not against letting them have a shot What's Under the Bed is an interview show where I speak with horror actors and filmmakers about their biographies, careers, and explore the things that shaped what scares them. Before the influence of movies, what scared you the most as a child? Was there a ghost in the attic or a monster under the bed? <laughs> uh, I love the name of the show, by the way, What's <laughs> Thank Under you. the Bed. But, um, you know, I was never afraid of that kind of stuff. I was never really afraid of ghosts or... I was intrigued, but it wasn't really frightening. Uh, it, it interested me and I was very curious, but not, you know, as a kid, I guess it sounds stereotypical, but not really much scared me other than, you know, I had some bully problems as you already know, but, yeah. um, you know, but the, that kind of stuff never really frightened me. I was never afraid of heights. I was never afraid of water or animals or anything like that, like creatures. Um, one of my favorite things to do at a convention is sometimes there are vendors that <clears throat> bring live creatures to conventions like snakes and tarantulas and stuff like that. And I love that kind of stuff. And my one of my favorite things to do is to get a tarantula, a live tarantula, and put it on my chest and then walk over to all these actors that play badass characters and <laughs> see who's a little bitch about it because <laughs> it's a live tarantula going like this on uh, walking up my shoulder and they're like, ah, and I'm like, you play a horrible mean character and you're afraid of a spider. So it's just entertaining for me. You attended Florence Drake Elementary School and Dilworth Middle School until the seventh grade. In your book, you give a harrowing account of the bullying you endured throughout middle school. I attended a private school where I was relentlessly bullied. It became physical twice, but the perpetrators announced a cool kids club devoted to tormenting me. The students who didn't participate were threatened with the same treatment. Uh, the abuse remained secret until parents overheard my classmates discussing it during my birthday party. An anti-bullying announcement was delivered to the class, but the school refused to inform the bully's parents. When the semester ended, the principal notified my father that I was no longer welcome at school. It was the first time I experienced betrayal from an adult. Your documentary struck a chord with me. Your story is an inspiration for me and so many others. Looking back, how would you have handled bullying differently? And how would you advise kids to deal with those situations now? You know, it's it's such a tough situation because it's so easy for someone to say, you know, just don't let it happen. Stand up for yourself. You know, obviously, Ideally, that would be the thing to do, but you can't do it. It, it. When you're in that situation, you try your hardest to stop it and nothing works. And often it makes it even worse. So uh, I, I would just, my, my advice is just to try to stay strong, know that it probably isn't really personal that what these assholes are doing to torment you but they're just doing it so that showing off to their friends or whatever and you just happen to be the subject of their uh, cruelty if you want to say it that way but 
um, it, it just hang in there because it will get better uh, eventually. It's just, it's a tough situation and impossible to describe unless you've been there. And those of us that have been there understand just, it's the same way with, you know, me being burned. There's no way, or no, no way that anyone could ever understand what I had to go through in being burned. Uh, but, you know, I don't try to explain it anymore. I just uh, say it's a, everybody goes through tough parts of their life and we learn from it and we move on. And, and the, the only positive thing that came out of the bullying that I went through was that it made me as an adult a little more compassionate to people that might be different uh, than the normal, you know, uh, average person. So I guess there was a, a positive impact on, on me in that way that I'm far more, uh, mm, what's the word? Not, uh, I, I'm just more sympathetic to everyone's situations and more try to be more understanding. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things that we live through. At 12, your father is assigned to a project in Kwajalein, and your uh, family moves to the small coral atoll in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. It is a mile wide and three miles long with pristine beaches and a vast central lagoon with a diverse range of marine life. You attend Kwajalein High School. Go Spartans. This Where is the fuck did you get that? How'd you Don't get ask that? questions. Don't ask questions. Wait uh, a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no Jesus television Christ. and the bicycle is your only transportation you might walk the reef at low tide looking for world war ii bullets and shrapnels from exploded bombs you do well in school steve knapp uh just becomes your best friend and you take up sports you play basketball baseball bat and basketball but mountain ball was your game what were you like in high school and how much of your high school experience informs who you are today also how do you play mount mountain ball Ah, yes. Good question. I can't believe you have an Eck attack there. Is that, that's my senior year, isn't it? Uh, sophomore. sophomore. Oh, is it? Sophomore, yeah. We couldn't find your senior. How the fuck did you get that, Dax? I don't even have that. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, had a bookmark to your, to your page, but I lost it. <laughs> wow. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> and that picture, Jesus, you you do your research, don't you? Um, yeah, I do. Yes. Yeah, so you know the island was amazing. Oh, that that looks like eighth grade or something, isn't it? Uh, it's sophomore. Oh, is same it? from the same book? Yeah. Wow. Oh my God! No wonder I got beat up. <laughs> uh, but the, the island was amazing. All of there was never any more bullying situations. There's no crime on the island. All we did was play sports and have a tremendous education because the teachers there were so happy to be there that, um, and all of our classes were so small that we really got very, very individualized attention. And, um, uh, and then it was just sports. And because we're, it's a, such a small island, we're the only school, obviously. So how do you compete in high school sports when there's no other schools within hundreds of miles? So we had to compete in men's leagues in, as, you know, uh, high school Athletes, we had to compete against men in basketball, baseball, mountain ball, which the difference with mountain ball is that it's it's played with a softball mm -hmm. and it's not slow pitch because uh, that was a different sport we had. But mountain ball was such that the pitcher 
had to throw the ball as high as he, he or she could. And if it hit the plate, it was a strike. And the plate was a little extended, so it was a little easier to hit. But it was quite an art to pitching the ball as high as you could so that as a batter, the ball is coming straight down. So how hard is it to hit the ball out there when it's coming at this angle as opposed to at you? Yeah. So it's a very tough sport to get used to. And I was the pitcher of the high school team and also had the highest batting average, which I know you already know all this, but <laughs> uh, just for your viewers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was, there was no sliding allowed because we played on coral sand oh the in the uh the uh uh infield of the baseball field was all coral sand which means oh. it has coral bits in it which are very sharp yeah <laughs> and if you tried to slide in that kind of sand you get all torn up so there was no sliding allowed yeah, the pitching was totally different, mm -hmm. and everything else about the game was the same. Your father's next assignment coincides with your graduation. Your parents moved to American Samoa, and you continue school back in the states. You study cartography at the University of Nevada in Nevada in Reno. You earn extra money working at a nursing home and would socialize at a bar called the Library. A spark lit for Hollywood when you answer a, a flyer to be an extra on Robert Altman's movie California Split, which rhymes. Uh, and you revisit your high school friend Mike Cutshaw in Hollywood, California, during your third semester. You catch the Wild West show at Universal Studios and leave school for Los Angeles to become a stunt person. You would be about eight years of training and hustling for jobs before you got steady work during that time. You were broke, eating peanut butter for dinner and adding water to your milk so it would last longer. You couldn't afford stunt school, so you joined the gym where the students would train to learn what you could. Uh, you'd work jobs in Nevada to afford searching for gigs in Los Angeles. In Reno, you joined a professional shooting and stunt team called Yesterday's Guns with the slogan, How the West Was Lost. Two years staging stunts and Old West gunfights was a great training ground for you. It was during this time you taught yourself how to perform a burn stunt. What, what are the absolute basic skills a new stunt per, uh, stunt performer should master when you're when first learning the craft? You know, you, you just need to start learning from someone who's been there. Just even if it's just talking about stuff. Uh, one of the main skills as a stunt person to have is an ability to fight uh, do a fight scene that looks like it's authentic, but obviously it's not. And it sounds easier than it is, but there's so many actors that I've worked with over the years that think they can do a fight scene, and they really can't. Because it's totally different than fighting for real, because you have to make all the strikes appear to be real just from certain camera angles. And... So it's really an art, and that's the the first thing to learn is how to fight for camp, I call it. Uh, and then, you know, you gradually start picking up other aspects, aspects of stunts, doing high falls where you just go 10 feet and get used to falling and then go higher and higher. And then if you choose to, you start investigating fire stunts, which I always loved. Even after I got burned, I still love doing fire stunts. Um, and then you go into cars. There's so many areas of stunts to learn that it it can take a long time just in the training process. And uh, you just uh, you just have to be open to listening to people that have had a career. 
Marilyn Newton was a reporter for the Reno Evening Gazette. She arrived at Paradise Pond in Sparks, Nevada, and on July 13, 1977, to write a story about a local stuntman. Instead, she witnessed your near-death accident when a demonstration of a body burn went horribly wrong, causing third-degree burns all over. Your skin fell off while the reporter rushed you to safety. Anything that could go wrong went wrong. Uh, reaching the hospital began a journey through an unimaginable, uh, unimaginable physical pain and psychological torment starting with a botched treatment that would nearly kill you. To say you went to hell and back is an understatement. You endured, you survived, and you thrived. Your courage to share your story has brought people from the depths of their own despair, and it's not hyperbole to say it has saved lives. Several pivotal people in this journey were Monica McMullen, the stranger who ordered you into her house and shower while, uh, and shower while she phoned for an ambulance, a stranger whose laughter outside your hospital room showed you could overcome your burns, and a woman with her own burns at the Santa Monica Pier. Would you share the significance of that last story? Well, I mean, the more significant one to me is the when I was in the burn unit and you know, it's the kind of injury where once you survive, that's just the beginning. Because now you get to know that for the rest of your life, you're going to have scars, visible scars everywhere. My whole upper body is scarred. So anytime I'm at a pool, uh, people are staring. And I, I, I understand because it looks different. So, uh, but you have to get used to being stared at. Uh, and the physical pain is indescribable, but you, once you survive, that's when the hard part begins because now you're like, hmm, now for the rest of my life, everything's gonna be different. And can I ever have the same life I did? Especially when you're still in the hospital and I was, and you get very depressed. Most people do. Uh, and because you're like, your whole life is going to be different. So I was very down at the time. And I was in my hospital bed in the burn unit. And when, it, when there's a burn unit, there's a nurse's station in the middle. And then all the patient's rooms are around it with windows so that at any point, all the nursing staff can look at all sides and see each patient through their window to make sure everything looks okay. And so I was in my bed quite depressed and not, not very mentally good at that time. And I saw a guy out at the nurse's station through my window that was laughing and fucking having a great old time. And I hated the guy because I was like, man, you're happy and I'm miserable and I always will be miserable. And I, I just did not like him at all. And, uh, then I realized I looked because when you come in a burn unit, you have to gown up, you have to put protective things on. So, because it has to be a sterile environment in a burn unit. And he pulled up his sleeve as he was talking to the nurses while he's laughing and joking around. And then I looked and I said, wait a minute, he has scars on his arm. And that at that point, I realized he was a former patient of the burn unit that survived and finally got out and was coming back to visit the staff, which most, most of the people I've ever talked to that are burned do that same exact thing. Almost like you want to show how, how well you're doing to the staff to save your life. And uh, um, then, so I, ne I never even met the guy, but that's when I started thinking, man, if he's, he was in here, he knows what I'm going through and he looks happy. So that was a huge turning point for me. And I never met the guy. I just, he showed me without even knowing it that I can have a life after this. And, you know, that's, that's the main part of that story. You moved to Oakwood Apartments in L.A. and began stunt work again. 
Highlights include Lone Wolf McQuaid with Chuck Norris and four years as a stunt coordinator on on uh, Days of Our Lives. You're best known for horror, but there's a number of comedies over your career. Nothing But Trouble, Adam's Family Values, and The House Movies all blend horror and comedy. Later, you'd appear on Adam Green's Holliston and Impractical Jokers. In 1984, you do stunts and play the character Older Geek with a dog named Worm in the cult classic sex comedy Hard Bodies. And then in 1986, you're hired on Avenging Force uh, and per you perform your first fire stunt since your accident you will do this stunt many more times including a record-breaking 44 second full body burn in friday the 13th part 7 in your blood avenging force is a turning point for you you are there are huge car chases fight scenes and high falls including one from the top of a crane landing high falls can be very dangerous a performer could miss the mat or split through a seam and hit the ground when doing falls do you prefer falling into boxes or airbags uh, I almost never used an airbag because when I first started doing high falls, it was always into boxes. And when I say boxes, it's empty cardboard boxes all built and then made into a, a landing area that's held together. And then a pad is on top of it. And the, the good thing about falling into a pad like that is that there's no recoil at all. With an airbag, you feel a little impact. High fall pad like a, a pole vaulter uses, it's an impact. With boxes, as soon as you hit, it collapses with you with no rebound whatsoever. And I always, if, if you build it properly and high enough, depending on how high you're falling, it's the best landing of all. So I've always preferred boxes. Impressed with your portrayal of a rotting corpse in an electric chair for the movie Prison, special makeup effects artist John Beekler pushes for you to play Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th 7. You're officially given the part on January 13th, 1988. It was a Wednesday. It shoots on stage in L.A. with exterior shots in Mobile, Alabama. Your mother gets a crew jacket at rap that reads Jason's mom, and it premieres Friday, May 13th, 1988, on your wife's birthday. Your physicality playing Jason makes you a fan favorite, and you play him in Jason Takes Manhattan, Jason Goes to Hell, Jason X, and then Gut Media brings you back in 2017 for the Friday 13th, the video game. You've given so many great interviews about the, fr the Friday the 13th movie, so I will touch on them briefly. As a fan of the series, before you played Jason, what was your favorite Friday movie before yours? Uh, I would have to say either part four or part six. I, I enjoyed both of those as a fan and a viewer, and I thought Ted White, who played Jason in part four, and C.J. Graham in part six were the best performers I had seen playing that character. So once I had the opportunity to do it myself, I kept their performances in mind uh, and then created my own. But um, it, I, I've, I've enjoyed almost every Friday movie. Uh, you know, I, I never saw the remake 2009 one, but because uh, it didn't seem like Jason to me, so I didn't care to watch it. But um, you know, it's just, it's, uh, it's been an amazing franchise and I'm honored to be part of it. You're Freddy Krueger at the end of Jason Goes to Hell. You're the only person who has played Jason, Freddy, Leatherface, Victor Crowley, and recently Michael Myers in the film Driving Le Driving Lessons. You're still missing Pinhead and Leprechaun. Uh, with Jason X, you're sent into space. Did you keep any props from any of the Friday movies? I kept a lot of stuff from <laughs> all of them. I kept all my hero masks that I, and I call a hero mask, the hockey mask that I wore mm -hmm. for most of the filming. That's my hero mask. I always kept those. I kept the Freddy glove from Jason Goes to Hell. I kept the Leatherface mask I wore. And, you know, it, you, it was easier back then to keep stuff. Nowadays, they know the value of those kind of things. So they try to avoid letting the actors keep them. But that was always part of my deal. I'm wearing the shit for hours and days and weeks. I'm keeping it.
You're a fan of Metallica and Insane Clown Posse. A hardcore indie rock band is named after you, and you sing for the first time in your career as the human pizza in the movie House 4. Do you think more songs have been written about love, lust, or heartbreak? Oh, my God. What a crazy question. Uh, <laughs> probably love. You know, uh, there's a lot of songs about everything, but I would say probably more about that subject than anything else. There needs to be more songs made about death and dismemberment, in my opinion. But I've heard uh, quite a few, actually. So, uh, yeah. Have you ever heard the band Kane Hodder? I've I have not. I saw them and it was like I wrote it in as soon as I saw them. And I wrote it in like almost 30 minutes ago. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, they they contacted me and said, uh, we love your name and we want to name your, our band after you. <laughs> so funny. And I did not think they were going to just call the band, band Kane Otter. <laughs> uh, I thought it was going to be, you know, Kane Kills or, you know, something like that. But they just named it Kane Otter. But they <laughs> did ask for permission and I was flattered. Stunt performers are Hollywood's unsung heroes, long overdue for a category in the Academy Awards. There have been so many greats since the first on-film on film stunts were performed for The Great Train Robbery in 1903. Buster Keaton, y Yakima Kanut, Dar Robinson, Vic Armstrong, Zoe Bell, and Jackie Chan, to name a few. What mm -hmm. makes a great stunt person? And who would be your Mount Rushmore of stunt performers? Oh, wow. Uh... For me, and this is, you know, the old timer in me again, I'm always impressed by stunt people that do everything. These days, people, stunt people specialize. Like there's guys, guys and women that just do fights or just do cars or something. When I was starting, you had to do everything to increase your chances of working. So... Those are the ones that I am more impressed by. Yakima it would be up there for sure. Uh, you know, I, even though I never really cared for the work as much, Hal Needham is up there. Um, Jackie Chan, you know, somewhat. He hurts himself a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like... I, I loved watching Jackass, but I never considered them stunt people because they just did crazy shit and did not try to minimize the chance of getting injured. And that's why they didn't have very long careers. You know, I've been doing this for 46 years and I always prided myself on the fact that I didn't get hurt that much. I've never broken a bone in my life. And even as a kid, and I don't think there's hardly any stunt people that can say that. So the point is to do a scary, dangerous stunt and walk away from it, not just do it and not care how long it takes in the hospital. This last question is usually a Sophie's choice where two must die so that one may live. But I want to do something a little different for you. Three characters go into a room, but only one comes out alive. So it's still kind of a Sophie's choice. Jason Voorhees, Victor Crowley, and the mechanical werewolf Metal Beast from Project Metal Beast. Which one comes out alive? Uh, I just looked at a picture from that movie yesterday uh, <laughs> where I have uh, uh, my buddy Rick McCollum, a stunt guy I've worked with for many years. I'm Metal Beast, and I have him up in the air choking him. Uh, he was doubling Barry Boswick. So... Uh, if the three of them went in together, Metal Beast would be the first one vanquished, in my opinion. Then it would be a hell of a battle between Victor and Jason. And I, I give a very slight edge to Victor because he's a little less predictable. Doesn't mean you can defeat him easier as Jason because he's so predictable but I think that gives a very slight edge to Victor and I'd love to do a movie where Victor and Jason meet 
and I play both characters. <laughs> That'd be so fun. Um, is there anything you want to ask me before we're done? First of all, I, I have to tell you, you are the most prepared person to ever interview me, I think ever, uh, with your your knowledge and your facts and your the fact that you have my yearbook. My God, I, I really don't even have that. But, you know, I just want to tell you, you're, you're very good at what you do. Keep doing it. I know you will. And thank you for having me on. And thank you for being so prepared and so on top of everything. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I'll be seeing you again at the next convention. Thank you so much. Thank you for sitting down with me. This was spectacular. I Thanks, know Dex. You too.